What we want to do this morning is, you know, the latter half of 2 Kings, I mean, what does Timothy tell us about the Word of God? It's all inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, correction, you know, rebuke, training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. But some portions of Scripture are more important than others. Let's be honest. It's all profitable. And the latter part of 2 Kings is, is great. It's a lot of battles, a lot of chronology. Um, Read it yourself. Take a look at it. What we're going to do is cover Jehu. Jehu is, um, you remember, the, the, the pattern I'm going to pray in a minute is Solomon basically builds the temple. Jehu cleanses the temple. And then uh, Josiah kind of reforms the temple. And so we're going to zoom in on Jehu here a little bit about his zeal for the Lord and how he's cleansing the temple. It's, he's a wild guy, king of Israel. Um, and then what we want to do is look at Naboth's vineyard. There's, there's something that happened with Ahab and Naboth and this vineyard. We want to return a little bit to 1 Kings because this prophecy of, uh, of Ahab and, and bloodshed and his descendants is fulfilled here. Jehu fulfills this because Jehu was actually with uh, Ahab when this prophecy went down from Elijah, Elijah, Elisha. So we're going to look at that and then we want to close with King, um, King Uzziah. King Uzziah, who was a king but wanted to offer incense. What's the big deal with that? He's being zealous. He's devoting himself to the Lord. Why can't he do that thing? Why was he struck as a leper? So let me open in a word of prayer. And then what we're going to do is, is be in 2 Kings 9 uh, here for a little bit. Uh, let us pray. Father, thank you for this Lord's Day. Um, you've commanded your church to, to make disciples by teaching everything Christ has commanded. And, and Father, we see you here, your holiness zeal for your house and your people, uh, consuming Jehu according to your command. We see his harsh judgments on account of sin and idolatry. May we see even the second coming of Christ foretold in type and shadow here. You are God who is holy and just and righteous, and we would be undone and struck down and cast off were it not for, for our Savior's love and his work of salvation. And so we we rejoice in Him this day. We take refuge in Him and we thank You that we are protected, uh, hidden in the shadow of His wings who has borne our sins and our guilt and our shame on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at Jehu. You remember um, Elijah and Elisha, two different prophets of the Lord. Mighty, two of the more famous prophets you think in the Old Testament, right? Who don't have their own book. We don't turn to a book of Elijah or Elijah. But in a sense, we're given like a very uh, wonderful detailed account of their ministry uh, to the Lord God. And these prophets really, they tended to do two things. One is um, they're issuing like the covenant lawsuit against God's people. They're, they're, they're giving warnings and exhortations and 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 even delivering promises of hope. And they do so based on really two covenants in Scripture that are, that are in the background of, um, of this. And one is the covenant that God made with Abraham. The other one is the one He made with Moses. And the Moses one's called the Old Covenant, right? What else is it called? The Sinai Covenant? And it's, it's even... Even more fundamental to the Mosaic Covenant is the Abrahamic Covenant where He promised, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And of course, the Mosaic Covenant is kind of the account of, of the commands and how Israel is in the land. How are they to act and to be, salt, to be light to the nations, to be like uh, distinct from every other people group based on how they worship and how they obey and all these other commandments about purity and cleanliness. And, and really the most fundamental therein were to have no other gods before me and then, you know, don't covet. And those two go hand in hand. We kind of looked at that last week. And so Jehu is, um, enters the fray in a very idolatrous time in Israel. There's uh, golden calves and Dan all the way to uh, Beersheba, like in the northern kingdom. Southern kingdom and northern kingdom, they're, uh, they're kind of at odds with each other. Uh, the one land of Canaan is divided into the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And you have these two kings, you know, uh, Jehu's in the north. And of course, no one's going to Jerusalem to worship, which is a big no-no according to the Mosaic Covenant. Because you're basically worshiping almost another god or the right god in the wrong way, which is, is, 
it's not even the gray area. It's super wrong, but it's a gray area whether you're even worshiping the true God or a God of the, your own imagination when you do that. The right God in the wrong way is like a very dicey thing. And that's happening in the northern kingdom. And God's just about fed up. And he's fed up with all Ahab's idolatry, all the descendants of Ahab, and all the wickedness that they're doing. Because what you see happening in these Old Testament things, uh, and it, you see it in leadership today, uh, in the business world, in, in the church, you see it with Adam and all of humanity, and you see it with these kings and all of God's people, is there's like this representative obedience. How the king goes, what happens to the people? The people go. Yeah. King's going off the deep end with his idolatry and his high places and, and his divinization to hear all the yes man from his prophets. Well, then the people are led all over the place. If the king reforms the temple and like pursues purity, then the people tend to return. And it's not just the king and the people. What happens is it's, not, it's the, the other people. If Israel's doing idolatry and all these shenanigans, then other nations come to war and there's famine and there's pestilence and there's barrenness according to this Mosaic Old Covenant. And then yet God, this is in the background, God will not utterly cast off His people because He's taken His people as His own people in the Abrahamic Covenant. Yet he will chastise them. He will, in a sense, bring covenant curses on them. And so Jehu is like one of the, the big captains of zeal to mete out God's judgment on Israel for their idolatry on Ahab's descendants. So I know we're going to zoom in on this passage. And if you haven't read it, if you haven't been reading 2 Kings, it's going to seem very harsh. Like, are you kidding me? Like Richard Dawkins has a quote how the God of the Old Testament is malevolent and capricious and unjust and wicked. And he's like a famous atheist. And, and of course, he looks at a passage like this apart from its covenantal context. When Israel agreed to obey and God said, okay, well, good, I'll bless you if you obey. And if you disobey, you're going to be cursed. And so the, the broader context shows that God is actually being faithful to his word, which is rather sobering in light of their unfaithfulness. So let's look at Jehu. And remember, Elijah, great prophetic ministry. Elisha is not a distinct distinct, different ministry. It is distinct, but it's like part two of the prophetic ministry to this divided kingdom. And so they had yeah, different guys, very similar callings. And you recall uh, in Elijah, his, his last hurrah, um, we'll get to that, but let's, let's just look, let's just look. You think a part of Elijah's calling, okay, back in 1 Kings 19. Um, e Elijah was at the end of his rope, battling Jezebel and idolatry, and he's ready to die, ready for the Lord to take him. And the Lord says, okay, do three things for me here before I take you. One was anoint Elisha as your successor. Anoint Hazel, king of Syria. And then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king of Israel. And of course, does Elijah do any of those things? I don't, think, I don't think so. I don't think he did. But now Eli, Elijah, Elisha is going to do those things. And so it's the same kind of prophetic ministry. It's just continuing on. So now Jehu is going to get anointed several years later. Look in uh, verse 1 of chapter 9. Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in. And have him rise from among the, his fellows. <laughs> you know who his fellows are, right? You're going to see soon. It's not just these ordinary fellows. These are like, like uh, big, studly, brawny warriors. This is like the commander of the king's army. And, he's, and of course, Elisha doesn't roll in there himself. He sends a very young man. You notice that? Son of a prophet. Like even like his, his buddy's son, almost. Like a, a pipsqueak of a kid to go run over here and give this big message and do this anointing ceremony to the, like, the toughest guy around. And the toughest guy is around, surrounded by all his cohort. And so it's, kind of a, it's a very kind of humbling scene. And so let's keep reading here. This is, of course, Elisha, what he's doing is just fulfilling the commands that the Lord gave to Elijah way back in 1 Kings. This is starting to be fulfilled here. And go on and have him arise among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Verse 3 of chapter 9. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Do not linger. And so you see the young man's given a very specific command. Okay? 
go walk in, barge in, make sure you get Jehu, throw the oil on, and then hit the road like as fast as you can. So almost open the door and flee. Don't stick around. Don't answer any questions. Don't, you know, get killed. <laughs> just go. Just go. And you see he does that at the, at the very end. If you look at the end of verse 10, then he opened the door and fled, right? So what he's going to do is issue this prophecy. So it's not merely, hey, Jehu, you're king. Have at it, buddy. No, the Lord issues, gives the anointing, and then he also accompanies that anointing for Jehu with a specific word, which isn't, doesn't seem like a pretty nice word, but what it is is a word to fulfill the Lord's judgment to the house of Ahab. And remember, Jehu, we have Solomon building the temple, Jehu cleansing the temple, and then, of course, another king reforming the temple. And so Jehu is like the, the temple cleanser, as it were. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, to which of us? To which of us all? And he said, to you, O commander. So he wrote, and see, you can see that there's no threat, right? No threat at all. Young kid, Jehu, he's happy to leave the parlay around the table and go solo and meet with this kid because it's not a grown man. He's not afraid for his life. He'll, he'll handle himself. Very, very wise in the way the Lord is, is working this about to anoint his man to cleanse the house of Israel. And the, so he arose and went into the house. There were six. The young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And you think it like verse 8, for I will cut off, right? Who's speaking there? The Lord, right? Who's he going to use though? This wild man, this commander of the army, the Lord is going to use means. And it's, it's pretty sobering how Jehu is zealous, utterly zealous for the Lord and the purity of God's people. And, and really the rectifying justice or himself being an instrument of the covenantal curse according to the Mosaic Covenant on these, this wild, rebellious bunch. And I will make, verse 9, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. And so, you see, it's not just be king. It's a very specific word. And this, this word, when you think of the Lord, like, um, you know, he casts our sins behind his back, right? Tramples them under, like, his, his foot in the seas. You know, there's great passages in the Old Testament prophets that our sins, you know, as far as the east is from the west. And you think, you know, praise God as you sit here in Christ. You've done a lot of dirt. Like, we get carried away in idolatry. Luther says, something to the effect that whatever you trust, like that is your God. And, and we, we ultimately trust the Lord for forgiveness and salvation. But then we don't trust Him for many other things. <laughs> Providence, suffering, affliction. And, and that's, you know, of course, we own up to it. Oh God, forgive me for my sin and my lack of trust. You've done nothing but good. You are faithful. You are wiser than I am. You know what is best. And, and sometimes we gnash our teeth and white knuckle it. And yet, that sin, because it is a sin, it, it's a form of being your own God, letting your wisdom or your knowledge be your own God, and taking the Lord's name in vain, in a sense, not trusting God as He's revealed Himself to be faithful and to work all things according to your ultimate good, right? Your Christ-likeness. Like, the, the thing about the sufferings and trials is that God is working out infinitely greater goods than you could ever imagine. Like, it's a reality. Like, he's certainly sovereign in his providence. And, and his purposes are, um, are difficult at times. But he's very inscrutable in his ways. And the fact that he's inscrutable in his ways, like this, that, and the other thing, you have to have the hope of the ultimate end, which is Christ-likeness, and much, much greater goods that he's working out than whatever you can perceive or imagine. And what does that take? It takes faith and hope and trust. And, and it certainly takes a lot of 
conversation with God if you look at the prophets, right? Or the, the Psalms are back and forth. They don't just say, thank you for my good theology. No, they're, they're lamenting, they're crying out, they're walking with God, they're talking with God. And yet, yet here is a is sobering judgment being fulfilled. And so Jehu obviously is reflecting on this and then the, the guys he's with, and we're going to kind of zoom in on why he would be given such a specific word. Jehu comes out to the servants of his master. They say to him, is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you, <laughs> right? This is certainly weird. Who would have the chutzpah to walk in to the, the, the parley between all these commanders of the armies and say, hey, I've got a word for you. Come here. Boom. Like a little kid, like look at like the guts on this guy. And Jehu says, uh, you know the fellow and his talk. And they know something's up. That's not true. Tell us now. And so Jehu quotes basically not just, hey, I'm king. He, he, gives, the, he gives the whole thing. Thus he spoke. Thus he so Man, I can't even read. Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment, put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed he's king. And then so Jehu's going to go on this like wild, zealous cleansing. It's, um, it's a call to action, really, isn't it? God forgets all of our sins, but the sins of his enemies he's going to deal with. And that's a, that's a very important thing to keep in mind here. Like, it's not that God looks down at Ahab and Jezebel and sees their idolatry and their sin and the fact that they're slaying the Lord's prophets and, and kind of anointing and consecrating their own idolatrous priests to worship to Baal or Asherah or Molech. And the Lord says, oh, well, you know, I'm merciful. Like, the, the background of that when you think of God's calling to Abram back in Genesis 12, he said, um, give you a land, um, going to give you a seed, and you all nations of the earth will be blessed. And then, he who blesses you, what? I will bless. And we love to quote that. You're blessed to be a blessing. You're blessed to be a blessing, right? But then, what's behind that? And we absolutely are. You think of all your gifts and your talents God's given you. Yeah, use those for others. They're not for yourself, but for others. But then, he, the next sentence, he says, he who dishonors you, I will curse. And there's going to be a lot who dishonor Abraham, who dishonor the offspring of Israel, who actually dishonor the, the remnant of the elect within the children of God, whether it's in the church or, you know, in the Old Testament Israel days. Like, there's an elect, and, the, and it's, it's even before Abraham and before Mo, the Mosaic Covenant, there's the, there's the covenant of grace with Adam and Eve. And you remember the offspring of the serpent, is doing what to the offspring of Eve? Make war. There's enmity. So behind Ahab and his, his what would seem as almost um, just careless worship and striking down is a very real battle between Satan and, and the people of God and the Lord himself. And so Ahab is going to be judged and his descendants by Jehu because of all their wickedness and because of their idolatry. And because of their great sin, I mean, they're striking down. Um, remember Elijah during, during some of his last days, Elijah's like, I'm the only one left. Like, it's that bad in Israel. And God says, well, I still reserved about 7,000. And Elijah's like, wow, like, where are they? Like, he, you know, he's either so in the thick of it that he forgets there's like a remnant, or it's just, it's so evil, that's all he can see. And yet God is going to bring about justice. And what he's doing through Jehu is that. And it's pretty sobering how he does it. And so in, in one sense, yes, when you think of your enemies, because who knows, you, Bruce sent an email from one of our missionaries, faithful, godly guy in India, Ken Tombing. Yesterday got it maybe 1030 in the morning and it's heartbreaking. Like people are being hauled off to jail, perhaps even being killed. Afghanistan as well, like Christians, like it's the offspring, this battle. And so when that happens, you have like one, you have like a couple options. One to forsake the Lord. <laughs> and we would all do that apart from the Spirit. And you see like the, the scriptures are replete with the Spirit giving people great boldness like Stephen to bear witness to Christ in the face of certain death. So often in our flesh, we think, how would I respond? 
and some people who may not know themselves that well or just who are great, ah, no problem, I testify. But then in, when you're facing the sword, you know, you think, well, I'd probably shrink back. But the spirit, like we belong to God. I, I really believe he'd give us boldness to endure <clears throat> such a death at the hands of the offspring of, of the serpent with, with grace and courage to the point to where we may even bear witness to others. And so as it relates to your enemies, don't curse them, okay? Don't be like Jehu to, <laughs> to those who have mistreated you on account of Christ or are harsh with you. Pray for them. Love them. Like the New Testament ethic towards enemies is not Jehu. Okay, Jehu here, if you look at him, look how he rides. This is, this is a rather interesting. So Jehu and all his crew are geared up and they're on the war path. And this is an amazing scene. Look in verse 14 and following. Um... Verse 17, Jehu is on his, verse 16, Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel for Joram, his king, right? And Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to visit Joram. So both kings, okay, north and southern are in, are in, I think, Jezreel. Now the watchman was standing at the tower of Jezreel when he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, this king, right? The king, you got it? Take a horseman and send to meet them. And let him say, is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? Right, the king, right? Who's king now? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And the watchman reported saying, The messenger reached him, but he's not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, and you can see, imagine Joram's blood pressure, right? He's probably popping the, the medication here, right? It's like this guy's charging ahead. He sends the messenger that's like, obviously doesn't look like peace. Maybe there's been some misunderstanding. I'll send another one real quick. Let's send them on the fastest horse we have because we need to gird up our loins and prepare for this. Who came and said, thus the king has said, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. Again, the watchman reported, he reached them, but he is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. And obviously, Joram says, make ready. And of course, not make ready for battle, but make ready so he can save his own skin. What a great leader, right? <laughs> Let me just save my own skin. Who cares about these people? And, and so he's on his chariot. And of course, Jehu clips him, or one of the Jehu's guys clips him with an arrow and he dies. And the king of Judah makes a little further and gets clipped with an arrow and goes and dies somewhere else. But, but what happens here is, um, let's, look, let's look at this, this wild scene in verse 24. Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his aide, this, this is a big scene here. It takes place in a very specific location. We want to look at that next. Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. And, and so that's almost like a, a passing statement, right? <clears throat> Do you remember Naboth's vineyard? Just turn there. Let's look at it. Because it's a sobering reminder. It's, uh, I think it's way back in uh, 1 Kings. Maybe 1 Kings is it 20, 21. <clears throat> Jezreel's the city where this is all going down. King of Israel, Joram, and the Azahel, they're there. Jehu's riding in furiously, shooting arrows and killing these kings. And, and he tosses Ahab's descendant into Naboth's vineyard. And he does so to fulfill the word of the Lord. And you think Naboth's vineyard, what is that? Just to allow it to be, to be kind of fertilizer. Well, Naboth owned a vineyard. And you know who his next door neighbor was? Ahab. Ahab, king of Israel. And uh, Naboth had a vineyard, but Ahab wanted uh, his land to have a little garden. And so Ahab approaches him and he says, you know, let me, let me have your land and I'll give you an, another land just as good. Or, you know, if that's not agreeable, let's, I mean, just look at, look, at, look at the passage. Look at this passage, all right? Verse 2 of chapter 21 of 1 Kings. 
Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house and I'll give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value and money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And when you think about it, like what is, what is Naboth mention? Well, he mentions the name of the Lord, which is something Ahab, of course, calls Elijah the troubler of Israel. Ahab wants nothing to do with the Lord or the will of the Lord or the covenant promises and faithfulness and the covenant requirements of the commands of the Lord. Ahab just will do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants it. And he's got a, a wife who's an amazing piece of work as well. And so Nahab, um, sorry, Ahab doesn't get his way. And what does he do? Like any powerful man who's never heard no and doesn't get his way. He, acts, he starts acting like a five-year-old. Look at him. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And look what Ahab does. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would not eat any food. I got a four-year-old. Sometimes four-year-olds do that. So do people who don't get their way, who are used to getting their way all the time. It's really amazing. And of course, Jezebel, look, she comes to him. Honey, what's the matter? Oh, look, watch this selective quote. Watch this selective quote here. Watch what he says. Jezebel's wife came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Is that what he said? Of course, that's what, Je that's what uh, Ahab heard. Remember, he was like, the Lord forbid. Like, he, you know, it's not about me and you, Ahab. There's a Lord, and then there's like an inheritance of my fathers. And, and of course, the, my bloodline's before and after me. It's much bigger than just me and you, buddy. And of course, all Ahab hears is, no. Boo-hoo, wah, wah, wah. Oh, come on, honey, help me, you know. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing scene. Look what she says. Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And remember, what we're, what we're seeing here is what? The Lord is in the picture, but what's the command? Thou shall not covet, right? We looked at that last week. And remember in the New Testament, we're given like this brilliant insight to what covetousness in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4. Covetousness is what, class? Do you remember from last week? It's idolatry, right? It's having another God. It's having another God before you. And, and of course, it makes sense that God would be out of the picture with Ahab because he's filled with covetousness and, and power and he get, gets his way. And, and so look at this. Now we, we see covetousness and idolatry. Watch all the other commands. Once you start breaking them, you know, James says, you've broken one, you've broken them all. Like people use that as saying basically, I've heard people use that, not in this church. You guys are a sanctified bunch. But if you've, if you've just, all sins are equally bad in the sight of God. That's baloney. Anger in your heart is bad. It's murder. But murder is much worse, right? To betraying the incarnate Son of God to, you know, the Romans and the Jews, that's very bad, right? It's a greater sin, Jesus says. Like, there's degrees of sinfulness. All sin's bad. The wages of sin is death. But there's some things that are much more heinous because of um, our confession. If you, want to, don't be, if you want the details, Read the Westminster Larger Catechism on degrees of sinfulness. I should know where it is. It's not in my notes. I don't know where it is. But it talks about who commits it, what it is, the day that it's done, like the intention behind it. Like it gives you all these qualifications on degrees of sinfulness. So don't justify your small sin. It's terrible. Don't do it. But watch the way this covetous says, hey, yeah, I want a little garden. Here's some of my wine. No, Ahab, I want your garden. That's his God, right? And who, who's his God? Ahab's his God, right? His own heart's his God. Now watch what it leads to. Jezebel. It's going to lead to lying. Watch the next thing. This stuff goes like just amazing. Um, verse 8. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city and she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And when you think about it, like, look how evil this is. A fast is generally to be something that's like, you know, a fast and then a big party and a celebration. A fast for a particular thing. May we be reminded of the Lord and then have this big celebration. Not just so I can be hungry and enjoy my cheeseburger or steak or whatever. It's not that. It's like, it should be like a religious kind of fast ceremony. And yet she's doing that with such ill intent. Proclaim a fast. 
but she's got murder on her mind. Set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in the city did, did as Jezebel sent him. Okay, what, what commands do you see, class? Don't be shy. What commands do you see being broken? Started with a little covetousness. Well, it started with Ahab being his own God, covetousness, own God, okay? Now we're into lying. Okay, very good. Which is six, right? Murder. But then also, remember the command to honor your, your mother and father? Okay, it's much deeper than that. It's like we have duties among equals. Superiors have duties to kings, and kings' wives have duties to those under their rule to rule rightly. And then, of course, city leaders and elders have duties to those under their care and duties to superiors. And so I would say the fifth. These people are just like, yes, men. Oh, let me save my own skin in my own city. We see what they're plotting. What are they going to do to me? Right? Real lack of courage and fortitude. So it's a command breaking fast like here. And then, of course, they do carry out the murder. Um, what, are we, what are we to make of it? And we'll, we'll just re read it. Verse 13, there's the fast, and, and here's the reality here. And two worthless fellows came in and sat opposite him. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. They sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And so Jezebel tells Ahab, Ahab goes down to the vineyard. Oh, thank you, baby, right? Look at verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, verse, chapter 21, 1 Kings Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. Notice the language here. And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? Stealing, right? Remember, we didn't get that one. Very good, Barry. Love it. Are we missing any? I mean, basically all of them in a certain sense, right? They're taking the Lord's name in vain which would be the third one, because what are they doing? Their own authority is their heart and their desires rather than the revealed will of God that condemns all of, this, all of these shenanigans. Okay? And, and terrible scene. But God sees. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord in the place where the dogs lift up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. And you know who's at Ahab's right and left here when this is, word is being given? Jehu. Jehu's right there. And he hears it. Because I just read it like 10 minutes ago. Remember Jehu reminds his little, his right hand man, hey, remember this is, <laughs> throw the body there because this is to be fulfilled when we were with Ahab over Naboth. Like he's fulfilling the word. And look, look what Ahab says to Elijah. <laughs> Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself, sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Like, that's really amazing, isn't it? Like, you think of who is Ahab's enemy. Like, it's the messenger who is the enemy. And you see this all the time. Messengers of the Lord try to speak truth or... You know, and you can do it in the wrong way, right? We all know people who are masterful, discernment, truth givers, but they're just kind of jerks, okay? There's a certain way to bring truth, but then there's also, you can be like infallibly bring truth and people will gnash their teeth at you. Don't kill the messenger is one of the most amazing statements in the history of humanity. <laughs> is that you? Have you found me, oh my enemy? Like what he should be doing is realizing, wow, I am an enemy of God. I am an enemy of God's people. And yet, no, you're my enemy. Like, it's amazing, right? The way that, you know, it said, if you point one finger at someone, you're pointing three back at yourself. You know, it's like, <laughs> he's just so hardened. He's so callous. He's so carried away. And it's time for the reckoning. And so I will say also, when one, pray for your enemies, love your enemies, those who persecute you. Blessed are you when you're persecuted, not for being a jerk or rude, but for righteousness sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And when you're persecuted, realize, bear witness when you're about to be executed for the sake of the gospel. Bear witness. Hopefully they're saved. Hopefully they, they reflect upon that and their conscience, you know, sears and the spirit works that they might be saved. But also take hope that the Lord is going to judge each and every sin. 
Each and every sin will get dealt with on the day of Christ's second coming. And Jehu is like a kind of a type of second coming. When you think how he's riding furiously, like the Lord Jesus Christ is going to judge with zeal and righteousness and uprightness of heart. And it's not going to be like disproportionate justice. It's going to be completely proportionate because we think sin is not that big of a deal, but when you think of it being against like an infinitely holy, righteous, good, loving God and, and who's committing it, those in His image who have this capacity and this will and this action for just amazing good, like it's, it's a terrible thing. And so you can take comfort also that the Lord is going to judge all sin, either on Christ on the cross, right? Or at His return. And, and as it relates to Christ on the cross, like if there's unforgiveness or bitterness in your heart towards a brother or sister, like, you know, God has atoned for that sin. I would say try to let it go. Try to pray for them. Pray for yourself. Try to forgive. They should know better. You should know better. Whatever. It is what it is. Life is so gritty. Grudges are so amazingly hard to remove. They become huge stumbling blocks and strongholds. And before you're consumed like Ahab and anyone who tries to call you out, is your enemy and so you're avoiding the word and you're skipping past passages that tell you how to live and how to love or or you're just reading them saying yeah i do all that <laughs> like you know it's it's going to be the word and spirit and and prayer that really changes hearts and don't i mean i'm not saying you're going to be like ahab okay it's not what i'm saying you're not if you're in christ like you're a new creature and god may you know we get a little out there but like he's a good shepherd who sheep hear his voice and he calls us back to repentance and rest and renewal. And so this Jehu scene is a sobering scene. And it's a picture of God's zeal for the sake of his own name. And really, you think, for the purity of worship. And so let's go to 2 Chronicles. Because this is, a, this is okay, you think 2 Chronicles, Pastor, we're in 2 Kings. Like, what's the matter with you? 2 Chronicles is taking place at the same time all this is going down. Okay, And I want to just look at Uzziah. Uzziah uh, is an amazing king in Judah, okay? He's super faithful, uh, 16 to 52. What is that? Like 60, 68, okay? 68 years old, 52 years of like somewhat of a faithful run. Reforms things, brings about a lot of good. Um, let's just look a little bit about him and then let's look how he turns. Because we tend to think certain sins aren't that big of a deal when they're actually the biggest deal to God. And so that's where we're going with this. Look what he does in verse 4. He did what was right. This is 2 Chronicles 26.4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah. Right? Prophet? Think the prophet. Who instructed him in the fear of God. So you think Zechariah comes to him and says, hey, fear God, do this. What does Uzziah say? Is that you, O my enemy? No, he doesn't say that, does he? He receives instruction and he reforms his life and the kingdom according to the word of the prophet Zechariah, right? He's being faithful to God. Opposite Ahab, right? Same couple years here though. Same stuff we're just reading. This is within a few years. And notice the qualifier here. Who instructed him in the fear of God and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Uh-oh, that's like, a, like, what is it called? Like a little foreshadowing? You know, you see that in movies. Um, he makes war against the Philistines, victory. Arabians, victory. Mennonites, victory. Ammonites, victory. Okay, and now when you think of that, why is he getting all this victory? Blessings. You obey, you'll be blessed. You'll get victory from your enemies. It's like terms of the Mosaic Covenant. And the obedience is reforming the worship, removing some of the idolatry, and then great victory and prosperity. So Uzziah is like green light, faithful. Look what he has in verse 10. Many towers, cisterns, herds, farmers, vine dressers. He, for he loved the soil. No famine, no drought, right? God's bringing rain and blessing. You get the picture. I say this every other week. So you get the picture. You obey, you get physical blessings in the Mosaic Covenant. You disobey, you get war, famine, pestilence, drought. Okay, so he's obeying. Boom. Great job. Good guy. Great guy here. Okay. Um, He's got a huge army, verse 12 and following. Okay, look at these fancy machines. But now we're going to get to his pride. 
which doesn't really apply to any of us. <laughs> in Jerusalem, he made machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped. Tell he was strong. And you think, like, tell he was strong. What does the biblical writer mean by that? He yeah, like he, be, you know, he became puffed up. He, become, he became lifted up. And he's a king, right? And you think of kings have certain, certain uh, vocations and callings to rule righteously, to see that the word of the Lord is, of course, uh, able to go throughout the land. Priests can do their thing. Prophets are heeded. Corrections given. Reformation takes place. And then now he's strong, though. Look, verse 16 and following. I'm just going to read it and then make an application, then we'll call it a morning. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, what's the matter with that, class? He just wants to worship God and just show his devotion to God and express his heart to God? What's the matter with that? Big, why is that wrong? It's the job of priests. So it's not his job, right? Yeah. It's not his job description. It's not. And you think, well, why, why? God doesn't want worship from everybody? Like, no, God's commanded worship in a certain way, and this guy is supposed to pump his brakes and let the priest do their thing. He's not authorized to do that. You think of, remember when um, there's a big fancy ceremony with Aaron's sons. The, I think the priests were being dedicated. There were sacrifices, Nadab and Abihu, and they have a little censer of, of fire, and they want to offer it to the Lord. And as soon as they do, the Lord hadn't authorized it, hadn't commanded it. He strikes him down, and then someone goes to Aaron, or the Lord may, maybe reveals it to Aaron, or through Moses to Aaron, and it says Aaron held his peace. And it's one of the most sobering passages in all of Scripture. Like his sons that he loved since they were little pipsqueaks are now struck down just because of some apparently sincere act of devotion. Like there, there's certain ways God commands to be worshipped. And to go outside of those, isn't just to be on like unsteady ground. It's, it's, it's not shaky ground. It's to be on profane ground. It's, it's not a common thing. Like when you look at these, this priest, look, look how the Lord justifies it. Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. So consecrated, that word means set apart. So the distinction here is the distinction between what's common, um, what's holy, consecrated, and what's profane, like unclean. And for Uzziah, a very common, good, upright king, a person of the Lord, to do something that is holy and consecrated, that he's not consecrated or commissioned to do, is to profane it. And so the priests are zealously trying to protect the temple and the worship of God. 80 of them, plus the high priest. And he's basically trying to strong arm them. And go out from the sanctuary, you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. The messenger again, right? <laughs> now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord. By the, and of course, he wants to hit the road right then, doesn't he? He hurries to go out because the Lord struck him. And you think of Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6. It's in the year King Uzziah dies. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. And he's like, woe is me, I'm undone. And when you think of Isaiah, it's because Isaiah is common and actually sinful, profane. And he's in this holy sanctuary, and so he knows he's history. More than Uzziah and more than whatever Isaiah did. Isaiah's in the courtroom of the Holy Trinity. Angels are even like covering their face and their midsection, and flying around. They don't even look at the gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ's glory there in Isaiah 6. And so what does that mean for us? Be mindful that you, you may come tired, you may come um, suffering, you may come weary, you may come distracted. Like once you step in there, not even when you step in there and you're talking and you're chit-chatting and announcements, but once that call to worship happens, like... We are in Zion. You're in North Hills. You're in these blue pews. You're in Valley Presbyterian Church. But Hebrews says that we're almost ushered into the heavenly sanctuary. If you read Hebrews 12 and 13, like we're surrounded by a myriad of angels to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. 
like around the throne room of God as our lives are hidden in Christ with God. And we're offering sanctified, consecrated, holy worship. And to treat it as a common thing or to be going, kind of going through the motions, drawing near with your lips, but your heart being, is, is not good. God's not going to strike you with leprosy. But you're, it's an it's a indication that your heart is struck, even though you may be a heart of flesh, that it is hard. And then, of course, the Lord's table is a perfect example. Because that's just little bread and wine, common earthly elements. But once they're set apart, consecrated by prayer for the Lord's holy use, to treat them as common without discerning the body of the Lord or to be an unbeliever is to profane it. Do you follow those categories? I said them fast. There's, you treat... Holy things is common, you profane them. Uzziah did it. The warnings with the Lord's Supper are there as well. Even your, your baptism, if you just, ah, oh, whatever, I'm going to turn away from, you know, the water and the words and the gospel and turn to something else. Like, that's a holy ceremony that doesn't make you Christian. But when you treat that as common and turn from the Lord, then there's great judgment if you never turn back to the Lord. Any comments or questions? Maybe you can cut the camera off for just a second. Um, thanks for watching. <laughs>